So welcome back. This time we're kicking off with Chapter 6 and getting right into initial project coordination. So what's happened is your C-suite, including your PMO, they have developed ideas for projects that tie to the strategic value of a company. They, and they've determined we can't do all projects, so we're going to do these two. Right? They picked a couple. They did a business case for each and benefits measure, uh, management uh plans right and they handed them to you and they said and to the pmo and the pmo picked you the project manager and you're like great here i go now i'm gonna kick off my project and that's where the initial project coordination starts and you start with two things you develop the project charter so what you're taking is the the business case and the benefits management plan and you're narrowing it down you're refining it into a charter later you'll refine it into a detailed plan and so you're going to build the charter which remember the charter is always high level but it still is important because the objectives in a charter are measurable you can measure them right so it's still valuable you'll identify some key stakeholders you'll want to communicate with a high level rough order of magnitude budget, some high-level risks that the C-suite folks are concerned about, and those sort of things, quality standards, and etc. along the way. Uh, you'll also want to develop your stakeholder register. A register is just a list. You create a list of stakeholders, because later we're going to analyze those stakeholders. So you create a list of stakeholders, including any outside clients along the way that may be part of it or that may change it. So, for example, if I'm building a nuclear power plant, one of my stakeholders is going to be the government agency uh, overseeing uh, pow uh, power plants. Another one will be the organization funding it. And another one will be a parent's organization because they may be concerned that you're building a power plant near their schools, right? So these are outside stakeholders, including the client themselves. Now, a project charter has these general elements. Again, all of them are high level. They're guiding from your business case down to your charter before you start your detailed project planning, right? And so, after you're done with the charter at the high level, you're going to build a project plan. So remember that the requirements in a charter are measurable, even though it's high level. The requirements in a project plan are detailed, right? So both are measurable, but that's really all the charter has is measurable. They're detailed in the project plan. Uh, and so to make your project plan work, you're, you're concerned with the iron triangle that we talked about, the triple constraint, scope, schedule, and cost. You want to set them, define them, have people accept them, and then drive towards them. Uh, if you make an adjustment to any one of them, it will impact the other two, absolutely. So you want to manage your baseline. You'll spend the rest of your life communicating and making trade-offs in that baseline. Now about the uh, plan. So I did want to give this quick analogy. So if the city of San Francisco and the city of uh, whatever is north of San Francisco says, hey, we could increase commerce by a hundred million dollars each if we could just find a way to move goods and services back and forth quickly. And so that really becomes part of the business documents, right? Yes, let's go do this. Here's our need. That's what a business document defines. What's the need and the benefits we expect, expect right? I increased income. And then you become the project manager. Here you go. Here's your business case. Great. I'm going to boil that down to, in, into a charter. First, I'm going to do a feasibility study. I'm going to look at, okay, what if I build a highway between San Francisco and this other uh, city? Mm, yeah, okay, that didn't work out. What if I do dirigibles, those air balloons that can be vectored? 
uh, to move cargo and things. Mm, yeah, too much infrastructure. Okay, what if I build a bridge? Ah, that may work. Great. So in the charter, you say, okay, I'll build a bridge, pass the feasibility study, and I'll make it eight lanes for each side. I'll add a bike lane because it's California. We, we have people that like to bike. I'll have a walk lane because it's California. People like to walk. Uh, it's beautiful, so I'll have a pullover point and an outlook, overlook, you know, a scenic overlook. Uh, those are measurable objectives in your charter, still high level. Now, in the project plan, I'm going to get into the engineering specs of doing just that, that sort of thing. Okay? And so, you could uh, pause and read this, but your, your project plan is going to detail these things, like the deliverables. All of the requirements your business analyst is going to collect. Uh, how are you going to manage risk along the way? That sort of thing. So uh, project planning is really a whole brain approach. It's the part of the brain that's logical, analytic, engineering wise. It's also the part of the brain that solves problems and says, OK, we didn't see this coming. How can we work around it? So it's really a whole brained approach to uh, leading. Well, one of the things you can do is a mind map. I love a mind map. It's a visual. When you don't know where to go, a mind map is a great idea. So you could pause and read this if you want. It mirrors what's in the readings that you've already done, right? So here's a picture of a mind map that I love, right? So you put the central idea right in the middle and you don't really know where to go. So then you first say, well, okay, I, ha I want to develop uh, an MBA program. What do I do? Well, I I'm going to have to uh, make sure that I uh, build some sort of architecture. Then I want to, what's the program's purpose? Then what are the trends in an MBA program? And, um, and then once you've done those, right, you've figured out a lot of these, then you'll say, okay, well, if these are the trends, what are they? Well, I, I want to go out and get input. I want to make sure I include the Department of Education. I want to have TED Talks and conferences, right? Those are trends, right? And you begin to fill out. Um, and, and this doesn't happen in a single sitting. This is a brainstorming over, I've done it over weeks, right? Where I put something on the board and I think about it and I talk to my team and I pull them around in the morning meetings and we add a few things to it and then we go about our business, right? So it develops. In the end, I take this mind map and I can turn it into a project execution checklist, which will also list many of my requirements. From that requirements that I just got from the mind map, now I can build a scope statement and a work breakdown structure. I can break down the work into manageable pieces. Uh, the work breakdown structure is interesting because if it's not in your work breakdown structure, it's not in your project. Don't do it. As a project manager, people are going to push you to do it and uh, you have to resist. If it's not in the work breakdown structure, it's not in your project. It's everything you're going to do, all the requirements on the project, right? And you'll break it down. It's called decomposition. You'll decompose. You'll start at just the scope statement and you'll build it into boxes. Okay, so for example, if I want to build a bicycle, first I'd have my scope statement. Build a bicycle that is good for a 10 to 18 year old. Great. So then I'm going to break it down into I need steering uh, handles. I need a uh, seat mechanism. I need tires. Well, the tires then would further break down to front tire and back tire, which because they have different, you know, the front tire just needs brakes and a tube. The back tire needs uh, gears and brakes and other things, right, tied to it. So uh, it, it can, it can, that's how you break it down from the scope statement into activities that need to be done to complete it. And uh, work breakdown structure is always considered hierarchical. It's it's a top to bottom. You're breaking something down into manageable pieces. Um, and, and that will then turn into an activity plan. Now, an activity plan is below. You continue to decompose 
the work breakdown structure, but activities are things that are going to apply to your project schedule. So you're actually taking the scope, breaking it down into work packages, which is still scope management, the requirements. And then when you're done with all the requirements, then you will break it down into activities, further decomposing the work breakdown structure. And so, uh, remember I mentioned build a bike, and one was the tires, and I had a front tire and a back tire. I broke that down. That's the end of my work breakdown structure. But the activities now in the schedule, I have to purchase the materials, the tube, the metal. I have to frame it, right? These are all activities that all result in that work breakdown structure item being done. But these are just activities that fill it in. So we further break it down to get these scheduling activities, but they're not adding to the scope. The scope is the tire, the front and the back tire, that sort of thing. Uh, they give an example, and it's related to the book on uh, career day. You can review that in the book. But notice that it's uh, generally considered a hierarchical breakdown. Notice, though, that a hierarchy doesn't have to be, it can look like an organizational chart. True, many hierarchies do. An organizational chart is a hierarchy. We've all seen it with our boss and our bosses uh, and a sub boss and other bosses and wherever we sit. But notice a hierarchy can also be in a form like this. This is a hierarchy, one A, B, C, D, E, F, two A, B, C, D, etc. It's still a hierarchy, even though it doesn't look like an organizational chart. Uh, but it, it uh, that's how it would be identified uh, regularly. And you want to think of it that way. Here is a, a common example. This looks like an org chart. This is also a hierarchy, just like this was right here. This is also a hierarchy, but so is this, right? But this is the common way of seeing it. And so my scope would be to have a conference that blah, 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 does this or that. And to have a conference, I need to have a location, facilities, entertainment, sessions, and staffing. To have a location, I need sites to pick from and dates. The facilities have to have equipment, food, and a building, etc. And you're breaking it down. You're decomposing the scope here into work packages, deliverables, things you can deliver along the way. And so the slide deck and the book gives uh, some good steps to creating a work breakdown structure as I described it. So we'll just leave that at that. Now, uh, the work breakdown structure, uh, you look at it and you're like, okay, that's good. I like it, but there isn't a ton of detail there, not a ton of detail. Where are my people? right? And so you want to create a work breakdown structure dictionary, uh, which is has all the data that fill in these boxes, right? And so part of the data that would be in the boxes in a work breakdown structure dictionary, we call it, would be, for example, the human resources, right? And notice WBS looked very similar to an OBS or an organizational breakdown structure, an org chart, we call it, right? Uh, they're very, very similar. Now, when you build those together, you can then assign activities for work to be done. And <clears throat> you're going to get, create then a race each other. So how do you know who's in charge of what activity here is being done? Well, you'd go ahead and you'd create a racy chart, a racy matrix. Racy stands for responsible, accountable, consult, and inform. Who is responsible? Who is accountable? So uh, it's a good topic to have. Notice on a RACI chart, I have the activities on the left-hand column. Who's responsible across the top? Notice there can only be one accountable person in each row. There can be several that are responsible. There can be several that you inform. There can be several you consult on each row but there can only be one person for each activity that is actually accountable, absolutely critical, uh, uh, accountable. They must see that it gets done. So we'll take a look, pause there, come back and talk a little bit about agile planning along the way.